Hi, good morning. What we're going to discuss today is eye accessing cues. Um, you may not have heard of these. Uh, it's a relatively new subject to human intelligence, but I find it extremely interesting. Again, these are just indications that people may be anxious or people may be trying to deceive you. Um, so we'll give it a go. It's hard to teach on just PowerPoint. I like to use live models when I'm uh, teaching for this subject in particular. But we'll see how we go. So I'm aiming to introduce eye accessing cues to you, maybe a new subject, and suggest how they can be used uh, against you in a confrontation, uh, as well as uh, human aspects of interviewing. Suggest how they may be useful during conflict or potential conflict situation. Um, so eye access and cues can be a tool to be used against you, like most of the stuff, but it can also be a valuable tool for you. Not just confrontation, but also for interviewing techniques. So the brain is pretty much made up like a computer, or a computer is made up like a brain, with the hard drive, the RAM, a processor. And it's very hard, as we've seen from the behavioral symptoms analysis lecture, uh, that to uh, stop um, indications of anxiousness or indications of deception. Remember the hand-to-mouth gestures, you're trying to stop uh, information coming out. Uh, criminals find uh, that it's hard to keep um, the information that they have inside. Uh, hand-to-mouth gestures are an indication that they, they want to keep what they have to say inside, but it's hard to blurt, not to blurt it out. I murdered them. Uh, so the hand-to-mouth gestures are like a physical stop to to talking. Uh, and the brain buries all this information uh, and it's it's very, very difficult to stop it leaking out um, when, when you're anxious uh, or your source is anxious. So these are what we call the representative channels. Sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. We call visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Gustatory, it's a great word, and olfactory. Uh, you're using these, so uh, refer back when you need to. So, obviously, what we see, what we hear, our perception, knowledge of the world is acquired through our senses. Some we use for specific jobs. If you're a human, to, if you're a human operator, then you'll be using these skills. Or maybe hobbies like uh, photography, wine tasting, fantastic, counseling. And you use different uh, representative challenges for those jobs or hobbies. So in photography, it's all about the visual. Mm. Wine tasting, it's obviously mm. the tasting of it, the scent, the smell. And counseling, it's listening. Mm. Being able to listen to people uh, and make the right signals that makes them feel better. Or at least makes them feel that you're building rapport with them. So how people use language is a clue to their um, how they what senses are their prime senses, and in each person it may be slightly different. Your dominant channels, how they proce process information, uh, and here's an example: um, when I was a police officer, if I was sent out to look for a vehicle who'd been involved, uh, which had been involved in a crime, my very first thing I would be looking for is the color of the vehicle. Whereas I would go out with other officers and they would be looking for the registrations, the numbers of the registration plates, and because that's how they took in the information. Other people would be looking at the shape or the type. And other people would be looking at the passengers, be able to spot them a lot quicker than I could. So the very first thing I would do was say, when I was looking for something, would be to say, what, what color is it? And that's the first trigger and then I'd be looking at the number plate to verify that and the make and model of the vehicle. Remember the scrim that we talked about in previous lessons? Uh, and then who's in the vehicle? Uh, so everyone processes information in a slightly different way. So if me as a source handler can identify a dominant channel in my source then that's a good way of uh, building rapport as well as getting information from them because you're, uh, you're getting straight to the heart of the matter uh, and you're 
encouraging them because that that's their prime channel and she encouraging them to to talk and talk uh, talk honestly so some sort of comments that might give you an indication of how uh, your source processes the information is how they uh, comment on on how the information comes to them so i see what you're saying is one way that people say and it's an indication of uh, how they take in the information visually that looks good I don't like the look of that so rather than saying I don't like that uh, it's I don't like the look of it I went blank my mind went blank let's cast some light on the subject so these are all visual cues that you should pick up on if they use them to say that this visually uh, is how they take in information um, more than the other senses. Do you get the picture? Do you see my point of view? So that word see indicates that their uh, prime sensory input is visual. Look at it like this. Hearing, hear what you say, that rings a bell, sounds good to me, listen to yourself, see how it's working? That's been rattling around my head. So the rattle words, auditory. Something tells me to be careful, auditory. That doesn't sound, spell a mistake, right. That just doesn't ring true. Another spell mistake. I do apologize for that. Kinesthetic feeling feels the right thing to do. Get a grip, solid understanding. I'm up against the wall, you're so insensitive. I have a feeling you're right. I can sense that. It just felt like the right thing to do. So the word feel in there, uh, feeling, touching, kinesthetic. So I mentioned this in previous lectures, uh, the fight or flight mechanism. So generally when people are open and honest in conversations, they will hold eye contact for about 60% of the time. So this doesn't mean if you have a uh, 30 minute interview with someone 60% of that time from the start to over halfway through they'll be looking at you and then they won't be looking at you it's you know, per sentence or per section of the conversation they'll look at you for about 60% of the time then they'll look away they'll look at their feet they'll look at the fingers they'll look at the walls they'll look at the mat uh, so around about 60% is open and honest In terms of being dishonest or withholding information, what do you think? About 30% or less. And intrinsically, we feel that there's something wrong with a person who can't hold um, eye contact with us for very long. They appear dishonest. And again, there may be cultural differences which you'll have to take into account. But if people are only looking at us or making eye contact for 30% of the time, and to us that flags up the potential that they're being dishonest. If it exceeds 6% of the time, they appear to stare. That in itself is unusual. I want to fight with you or I want to make love with you. Over 60%, that's the sort of message you're, uh, you're starting to send and people get a bit freaked out by it. So it's a very careful balance of half the time you're looking at them, you're nodding, you're trying to draw out information uh, and the same time, same thing, you've got to be doing the same, you've got to be maintaining a reasonable amount of eye contact. And as I said about cultural differences, you have to work out uh, where you are on the spectrum as far as uh, culturally uh, making eye contact. Amor, love mentioned that. More than 70% indicates arousal. It could be aggression, it could be sexual. So when people start to think about things, they start to look inward. Um, it's the same when you're driving and, and you're talking on a mobile phone. Speaking to someone about business, you start to think, okay, back what did we do about this? Did we put that order in? Uh, what should we have done differently to make the client happen? And your focus switches from the road to internally. 
and that's exactly the same when you carry out an interview or you're trying to get information from a source. So they will naturally break contact. They will look up, they will look left, they will look down. Uh, and we'll cover that in a couple of seconds. They may be thinking about what they're going to say or how they're going to say it. So the eye movement. Um, generally people move their eyes in a systematic way uh, in specific directions when they're recalling information or they're making information up. So generally it will be as we've said visual, auditory, kinesthetic, sight, sound, touch and feelings. And here are what we call eye accessing cues. So the one top center visual defocused is someone who's either trained or they're very good at just keeping a, um, a bland picture so as not to give too much information away. Um, but if they're defocused, they're still thinking inside their head about what they're going to say or what happened. Top left, visual constructed, people making it up. So they're looking back and uh, they're looking up to the, up to the right and going, I'm going to make this story up or what was that lie I said or what was the last lie I said to this guy. Uh, top right, visual remembered. So they're actually recalling something that actually happened uh, or as best as they can see it. Then you see down in the middle the auditory. So what did they hear? Make it up. Or what did they remember? What did they hear? Uh, that actually happened, and the feelings are in the uh, on the bottom line, the kinesthetic, um, and they're useful uh, for recalling uh, traumatic events, for instance. So some people do this back to front, just like peop some people are left-handed instead of right-handed. Some people with the visual remembered, for instance, won't be looking up and left; they'll be looking up and right, and there's no there's no link to it being left or right handed um, but it's just some people are backward <laughs> no I don't mean backward in a, in a behavioural way but um, some people are back to front as far as the eye access and cue so you have to um, ask them sometimes some key questions like what was the colour of the first car that you bought or what was the score of the last soccer game you watched uh, and see which way their eyes move after about three or four questions then you've got your baseline Ooh, what's that? so again similar uh, but uh, slightly cartoony versions um, the bottom kinesthetic and your audi auditory Digital, so your kinesthetic is uh, your sensations, your touch, your feelings, your body, and your auditory is what was going on in your mind at the time. Um, so it could be uh, a parent dying, for instance. Uh, if you're recalling how you felt at the time, then you, you may be looking down to the right. And that's why um, TV presenters, when they speak to people about traumatic events, will draw the microphone down and to the right to try and draw out those feelings. So this all links with the uh, Neuro Linguistic Program Eye Patterns, NLP, uh, and we're going to a little bit into too much detail here. Uh, really what you should be picking up on are the eye movements can be indicators of people telling the truth, they can be indicators of people trying to deceive you. Uh, and there's lots of reading up you can do on the subject matter. Um, but as you can see, just a, a follow on, this is where the eyes tend to move. And it may be that some people, their eyes move very little. Some people are very open about it. Uh, watch TV programs and see how actors perceive this eye movement. It's quite, it's quite funny, they, they do it uh, with largesse. Because obviously they're acting, but they're trying to show people that this is how their eyes move when they recall a crime or recall where they were at the time of the crime. Used by psychologists to uh, assess individual perception skills, that's true. Um, for dyslexic children, 
but for us to give us an assessment or a potential assessment or at least a flag that truthfulness and reliability of the source uh, and the sort of the information that they're recalling or and also the opposite it could be that it, it indicates that they're lying or they're trying to deceive us so if we have seen it before we've been truthful visual recall VR look back on the uh, the diagrams I just showed you remember that in some people they can be uh, back to front so they could be looking up and to the right but this tends to be the norm visual recall if you've never seen it before and we're making it up or imagine it PC visual construction the opposite direction and up if we've heard it before audio recall off to the left and again remember that it may not be all the way over to the left or maybe just a slight movement to the left when they pick up that auditory recall memory never heard it trying to imagine it or make it up in the opposite direction so if you're uh, recalling something you heard or internal dialogue so something that's going in your mind thoughts processes and if you've been re it's recalled through the feelings I remember someone a, a death of a parent for instance or a spouse or a dog or a rabbit kinesthetic how did that Indian curry taste what did it smell like you'll get eye movements similar to this and that it may flutter a bit because uh, they're drawing on their emotions it may close if it's traumatic you know tell me about when your dog got run over eyes may well fill with tears if it's a very traumatic event uh, so it's it's uh, quite a strong emotional indicator when the eyes go down like that and to the right and there doesn't seem to be any cultural differences to this according to studies and as I said there may be reversed in some people there's no it, but if they're reversed they'll always be reversed and it's not linked to left-handed, right-handed people in any way. And if uh, the people are reversed, you have to establish that. And then the eye movements will always be consistent eye. They will always be reversed. So ask some key questions. How did you feel when your dog got run over? I see again the first car that you bought. Uh, what color were the seats? Here again, the first uh, record you bought, first tape you bought, first DVD you bought. Watch and listen to the response, um, and set your baseline from that, or ask them more questions if you haven't got a baseline. I think this is very interesting, but it's just a small component part of um, the management of sources, or uh, interviewees, the people you're interviewing, so test it out test it out in your family that's always a good start point test it out in your colleagues uh, establish their baseline and then you know, ask them general questions to see how uh, they are either making it up or they're recalling the information it's a good tool for uh, for life uh, but it's excellent for human intelligence so uh, 